see. Hey, glory to Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, we can, you hear that voice? That's Colin. Colin Pimple. Uh, in Australia, you'll recognize the accent. <laughs> and <laughs> Good day. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and he's in Goulburn, which, you know, that's not the romantic part of Australia. Yeah, uh, but the COVID isn't doing too bad there, which is good to hear. So in areas the state of Victoria, so the building, everything is the bottom half, the bottom quarter. That's in there for five days because they've. But um, yeah, everything's fine down here. Just very, very boring. Um, yeah, boring country, country. Nothing special going on. Yeah. Boring is all right. Yeah. So we uh, we started a conversation about uh, Warhammer and the Horse Heresy yeah. and some of the things that you know. Not that we can learn about orthodoxy, but you know some of the yeah some of the things we can learn about what what's really true by studying fiction. Yeah, and that's kind of a fun thing to do. And yeah. today I wanted to kind of warm us up by talking about transhumanism. So this is one of the things I've been talking about it in years, but I used to talk about it every once in a while on the podcast. And this is the idea that we can improve on our cells on our race through things like genetic manipulation. And even easier, just by taking the right drug cocktail, right? That's that's the thing where a lot of money is being spent right now, you know, by you know really rich tech people, right? So uh, they're doing the, the longevity drugs, they're doing the awareness drugs, and the idea is that it will give you some kind of an edge, but and it's dangerous, it's dangerous, uh, because you know it takes. It makes you so focused on your health that you know you lose any kind of perspective on what's real and what's important. And what's and, and I think it's it's one of the ways, you know, we have this yearning for immortality, we have a yearning for connection, we have a yearning for all these things that are realized or are promised that they will be realized in the new humanity, right? In the church and the days to come. And we're trying so hard with, now with technology to do all these things on our own. So you look at you know the ways that um, scientists are trying to work us towards immortality by uploading your consciousness into you know another clone form or into a computer or whatever. And then you've got the the idea of you know connection. I mean, the next step you know in our connection really is some kind of telepathy, where you have the constant awareness of other people's thoughts and. You know, and, and the, the point here is that any of these things without Christ is a hell. It's hell. It's a hell of our own design, right? And mm -hmm. so that's the setup here. One of the things that is brought up in the, the Warhammer series, and we'll talk about the Horus Heresy part of it, is transhumanism. And last time we talked about the emperor. Right, and he's a really mm -hmm. ambivalent figure. You know, at, at first mm -hmm. the, the books it makes it set up like he's the counter to chaos, but he's really not. Yeah. He's really. But anyways, when he was trying to bring uh -huh. order back to Earth, he set up um, an army of you know intentional mutants, right? And it and it was so successful that he decided to do it on scale. So can you talk about that? Yeah. Part? Um, well, first of all, after he conquered the Earth, if you've got to remember, when he conquered the Earth, the Earth was basically distinct of, of a war zone where for thousands of years people had detonated bottle, nuclear, uh, viral weaponry, psychic weaponry, um, all of which was on the planet for thousands of years. So you had a Mad Max type. What was 
concept was to repair the gene damage done to humans. You literally had mutants walking around. Something just happened, did it? Here's something, man. Oh. Oh. oh, that's cool. Anyway, so the the um so he repaired the genetic damage to the to the human population. That was his first mission. Then he thought, um, well, what I can do is I can make um create an army of super soldiers. So the first soldiers he actually were built were the custodian guard. And you read about them in the in the novels. They are they are his bodyguard. They're like they're completely different, and they protect him. Um, the custodians are the most magnificent assassins, champions that you'll ever find. Um, the next one, he built the Thunder Warriors. Now, the Thunder Warriors were these big, brute um, berserkers um, that he used to conquer the conquer Earth. But they were genetically unstable and they only lived very short lives before they would die. Uh, the next stage in that was the development of the Primarchs. Now, the Primarchs is where, where we start getting interesting, Father Anthony. Um, yeah, you get the, he created the Primarchs who were to be leaders of his armies. He, the Emperor wanted to reconquer the galaxy. Now, when we're talking about transhumanism here, we're going... With the Primarchs, we're talking about a, another level again. You're building demigods, literally demons, okay? So what he essentially did was he get, you know, the war energy. He would break the psychic energy, gather whatever he needed. Like, for example, Lorga, he would have got, somehow got the souls of the greatest preachers, politicians, and what forged them into one or got the greatest leaders or engineers or scientists and put them in one Primarch, etc. Okay? So he literally be creating demons. Then he'd make bodies for them using alchemy, etc. Now what what you wouldn't you couldn't you, you that kind of transhumanism is literally building a demigod is the ultimate form. Now uh yep. Yeah. yeah so and and there, you know, we're not gonna spend a Let's let's move on to the Astartes yeah. um, in just a second, but it's a great point that you made. So this is the equivalent in our cosmology is like the Nephilim, where you're intentionally yeah. molding together uh, through, you know, like you said, alchemy and, and dark arts. Right? This really this is why I was saying the emperor is not light. You know, you get this idea that he is because you know there are people who, who pray to him and that, that there's a big show of light that rescues them from chaos. But, I mean, he's willing to sacrifice just zillions of, of people, um, literally sacrifice their lives, so to preserve his power and increase his power. And he's making bargains and he's playing with all this dark magic um, for, you know, what he considers to be noble purposes, of course. And so he creates these, these Nephilim um, demigods, like you said, yeah. by the Prime Marks. And then he takes the... His, his former attempt, not, not just with the custodians, but also with the Thunder Warriors, um, and he creates um, tailored transhumans to match each of the prime ones. So, so talk about yes. how that works. Well, what he did is when, you've got to remember, the Chaos God saw this Primarch project and saw it as a threat. Now, in the novel, what happens is the Chaos God sent a group of word bearers back through time and got them to sabotage the shielding on the Primark project. And that allowed the Chaos Gods to get in because they had these jealous shields that they use on starships to protect the fort, to protect the base. So any, so anyway, they, um, what, what happened is once the Primarchs were scattered, they were scattered, each one of them was scattered to a different, a different world. Now, what that left the emperor he is the genetic material which he used to implant into specific human warriors now each of those primarchs had a particular genetic trait, and he implanted them into into adolescent boys um and made them into space marines and this is where and they developed into space marines these nine foot tall monsters that could spit acids sleeping 
suspended animation and um, pick up cars and wait a ton. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing you can kind of imagine it being um, possible, right? Where you manipulate someone's genes so that they have, you know, extra organs and, you know, you're saying they're monsters, you know, they have this extra strength, they have huge ability to recover from injuries, um, you know, and dependent on their gene seed, like you said, they can survive in different atmospheres, they have these abilities, and they also have, um, this is where they start playing with stuff, right, is they have this um, instinct for community with their own group, right? Um, with some, with most legions, then you've got legions like the Night Lords, who are probably not the best to keep in their own group because they keep because they basically start killing each other. If you know what I mean, just think yes. they're just really, you know, or the uh, white scars who tend to be fractal, or the world eaters who are very, very, very hot tempered. So yeah, that's a great point. So it varies by, and and this is where I want us to go after we talk a little bit more about transhumanism is about. Yeah how um, each of the, the Primarchs, the Demi-Gods, and also the Associated Legion, they had these, these kind of virtues, I guess, these capabilities built in, but they also came with these huge temptations that, that set them up for failure. Well, so, well uh, is a question. The main one is, I think, that I think that had a, t had a huge virtue is probably Conrad Kerr's, of the Night Lords, he had a, he wanted justice. Okay, he was an alt. He he was about justice, and saw everything in black and white. If that makes sense, and yeah. what he and what he could see is every because he could see the future without the warp. Basically, um, he would see the worst parts of humanity. Now. I can give an example of that. I read of a very simple to give it, to give you an example. It's to what he would see. Let's say you could see what he saw, and you're walking down the street, and you happen to see a police car. Next thing you know, you see that that policeman's been killed. Okay, he's about to get killed. You, you know he's about to get killed. Or you look up in the sky and you see an airplane. You know that plane's going to crash. Or you're going to know. Or you see. Um, you know, a, a bushfire or, you know, that, that this city is going to have this disaster or this is happening in the world or every bit, it would drive you insane. And that's what happened to Conrad Kurz. And so what did his insanity look like? How did that manifest itself? It manifested as he would just butcher people. He would just have these dreams and he'd just attack whoever was there. He would, um, like... He's he when he'd have his dreams, he attacked Rogel Dawn, um, nearly killed Rogel Dawn, mind you. Um, and but his 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 dream manifested itself is that he saw he, the Imperium in, engaged in civil war, that um, that his sons would turn traitor and that they would be outlaws trying to tear down the Imperium thousands of years later. So he knew how everything was going to turn out. Yeah. And and here again, so that sounds like a great thing, right? It'd be wonderful to know yeah. what the future is going to be. But if you don't have some kind of special grounding, it, it'll, yeah. how could it not drive you crazy? And that's what happened with Conrad. He had no one to turn to. He's, um, he couldn't tell his brother. I mean, he... Um, and yeah, he, he didn't have that grounding because there was no one he could trust. And when he did confess them, they all thought he was insane and locked him up for a while till he um, got out. And so, how did it manifest itself in his legion? Because the legions they aren't just like the Primarch, but they the the emperor he built in their attributes in a lesser well, way the to their studies. Well, with the, the 8th Legion, his Legion was basically um, recruited from a, originally from a prison planet where at the Unification Wars, everyone who, like, whole civilization would just dump their prisoners in, in underground caverns. And the children of these killers would grow up to be Knights' children, and that's where they were recruited from. So there were these 
these killers who would do work in black and white, very black and white. So they, they, there was, they were, their job was retribution basically. So that was part of Conrad Kurz's makeup as well. So his um, attribute for justice was made up in his sons where they would literally, if you, if, if you are a planet and you didn't surrender or you rebelled, then they would skin the whole population. Right. Yeah, so yeah. You've got that, a... was, that was their job, right? Remember, so the context of this is the Emperor is retaking the galaxy for humanity. He's trying to find all the lost civilizations, connect, connect them back to him, his empire, and defeat all of the, the Xenos, right? Because, yeah, and... And, and the, the, the job of the of Connor of the Night Lords was anyone who came tried to bring the sins of old night back or tried to draw or, or plotted against him, that was their job to punish, but publicly, literally making bloody examples of them. So let's look what, at one of the examples maybe of um, these virtues that were overdone that didn't lead to um, the the Primarch to embrace chaos, but also didn't lead to, you know, kind of a, a holy virtue, you know, because you, anytime you're subservient to someone as ambivalent as the emperor, right, you're, you're still making a, a deal with the devil. Well, you look at, um, say, Ruby Lake Gilliman of the Ultramarines. Yes, they're not a very popular, the Smurfs, we call them. Now, Gilliman, Gilliman um, was an empire builder. He fought campaigns and he would build civilizations and create these stellar realms. He was a planner, he was an organizer. Okay. And his virtue was, he, although incredibly loyal, he was an empire builder and he was the guy, kind of guy who, who wanted everything done his way. Like he wanted the other Primarchs to follow him in his Ultramarines, how he developed his system, his because his virtue was he was low incredibly loyal and he wanted to teach them. He was still very much a tyrant at heart, you see? Where he built Empire Secundus. Everything Gilliman did was um you know was he, he wanted to have, to, or it was like Diocletian in a way. You know the Roman Emperor Diocletian? Yeah, right, right. Very much like him. Yeah, and so you have this, you know, on one side it looks very ordered, right? He's lawful good, you could say. But it, it doesn't end up being completely virtuous because it's still, it's still selfish. Right? And, yeah. Um, there's there's one of the things that you hear about when the thousand sons got attacked, they were outlawed across the Imperium. What happened is they were fighting with the Ultramarines, and what the Ultramarines actually did is they just ordered all their troops just to massacre the thousand sons without remorse, and they just did it. But the thing you've got to understand is that the Imperial fists were with them as well, and, and they were fighting orcs, so. To give them an honourable death, they didn't do anything. They just pulled back and didn't support them and let them get wiped out by the orcs. Whereas Gilliman massacred them. Yeah, because you know he was he was all about order, and they were, you know, chaos. So they had, they had broken the rules of the Council of Nikea and so on. And yeah, yep, so that, that had to happen. And he didn't even know about chaos. It just, it, but um. Um, yeah, so then we went to the other Primarchs. Then you have Petuabo, who's one of my, who is probably the most tragic of them all. Petuabo of the Iron Warriors. He was the Emperor's fortification storming specialist. He could take any objective. He could take attack any world with maximum amount of firepower. He would just, if you're a planet, he would just rain destruction on you. If you tried to resist, he would just crush you with armoured treads or just bury you in, in, in artillery. So, um, and he had a, he 
was when he first took command of his legion when they got him off the world where his case was when he was when he was set on the planet of olympia it was of city states and backstabbing and tyrants and siege warfare and he was the smartest guy on the planet and the fact was when he was the only primarch who when sent to that planet had nothing to learn from anybody except his own superiority so you imagine um, being dropped from space on a world and you're smarter than everyone else and you know more than every, anyone else, what kind of spiritual state would you be in? Yeah, well, that'd, be, that'd be prelates. Yeah, it's like the fallen angels in Genesis. When they come to Earth, they're, they're, they're like that, you know? Right, right. And... So how does he end up being the emperor's... Kind of, Praetorium. That's the Rebel Dawn. That's the Seventh League. Oh, sorry. Bro, uh, yeah, Perpetuabo of the Fourth. He came from a rather generic. The Fourth Legion was pretty much his legion became were a legion that did anything they'd be asked to do, and they took stubborn pride in doing it. If you gave them a mission, they would do anything they could to do it, and they would follow their lawful their, their lawful orders. Um. Because you've got to understand, Legion's got pride, got very proud at that time. So if you'd went to Horus' Legion and said, Horus, I want you to garrison this planet, Horus would say, no way. But Petuabo's Legion, before he came, we need you to garrison these planets. They're too dangerous for anyone else but you. Okay, we're the Workhorse Legion. So they'd do it. And they had a tendency to have a pride about them that, that if they said they'd do a complete admission they would do it no matter what if their plans fail they'd still keep going um when Petuabo returned to his legion he reviewed their records and basically said um i've reviewed your records i'm going to decimate the whole legion and the reason he did that was not because they'd they'd failed in the service no no not at all but that they didn't come through to their true potential so he wanted to motivate them and he made them beat one, it, one, what is it, nine out of every, nine out of ten had to beat the tenth to death with their bare hands. And that's how he proved to his legion. Now, you can imagine the effect that had on the legion. They became very bloody and brutal. And this was a reflection of Petuaba himself. He wanted to be an emperor. He wanted to be a builder. He wanted to be like Gilliman. He wanted to build civilizations and protect them. He wanted to be a protector, not this guy with a battering ram that crushed civilizations. And you can imagine what, what they had inside of him. All he was doing was things, things, and he also had um, an envy with Rogel Dawn because Rogel Dawn was doing all the building and protecting while he was out destroying things. And the fact that two were diamond was so much the same that they that they enraged each other. Yeah, so you that, had you had jealousy. The envy, yeah. Yeah, so and the fact Yep, go ahead. I was just gonna say that um, one theory that, that that's in the in the background is that Petuabo had just had a lack of faith in what the Great Crusade was about. They were just tools and machines. Yeah, and that's you, you see that in some of the well, in the, in the early parts of the Horus Heresy books about this ambivalence, you know, reasons for ambivalence about the, the whole quest. You know, <laughs> why couldn't you just leave us alone? Right? It's, yeah, it's one of the one of the things. So, um, yeah, and we and we talked about some of the the Primarchs fall um, before. You know, the 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 big ones for me are. Uh, the Thousand Sons and the Word Bearers, right? Um, yeah. And and that's you know those have clear spiritual dimensions, right? About yeah. when you're when you're trying to get hidden knowledge, you're opening yourself up to to things that are just um, just dangerous that you don't understand. Well, well, I can give an example of that. I was going through my books. Um, as I said, when I was at university at college, I used to download books. Right? I had torrents. It's, it's over now, so. Um, anyway, I used to download them. If I see a movie, I'll be like, oh, cool. Anyway, so we had this college one, and, you know, 
we used to do that college, and I got a whole book of books. And if there's any author out there, uh, anyway, um, so. Anyway, I was going through these books, and it was a whole heap of Cthulhu, Cthulhu books. And I was going through them, and, and this is just the other day because I was just looking at these massive amounts of science fiction, old science fiction books. Um, and I was looking through them, and I found a book called, you guessed it, the Necronomicon, good old Mr. Tonic. But this was written by a guy. This one's interesting. It was written by a guy called Simon. Now, that's Simon one. I was reading somewhere, it was about that, you know, that there was a demon hunter, Ralph Searchy, I won't call him, he worked with the Warrens and he was in big exorcisms and things like that. But he mentioned that particular book when he was, when they were dealing with a demonic infestation with these disorganized Satanists that were setting in on people. And he mentioned that book in passing, I look it up, Simon's Necronomic, guess what the first, because it's an e-book, right? Didn't even know I had it, it's like, there's a big, like, spiritual warning. This this book contains dangers to your spiritual, mental, and physical health. So, you know, you know how I mean. If you get into that knowledge, that'll flick through it and had this like a step by step. And I thought, don't you touch that. That's big trouble. You don't, you know, for anyone out there. Um, I remember you had James on there and all the trouble that caused right. for him. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, a couple of kinds of trouble. One, one, it messes with your mind. Right? And it's about power and manipulation. And there really is a world that we don't see and that isn't really our world that is looking to manipulate us. So you just get into all kinds of, of trouble there. And that's why, you know, Milton Bradley's Ouija board. You know, that's crazy. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah I don't, I, I've known that the thing is Ouija board, man. Because uh, I know every time I watch, like you go on YouTube and you like say, watch a show called a Haunting, for, for example. How many episodes is it someone's got a Ouija board and used it in a house and then they have to get the exorcist in and it's this grueling, terrifying year or couple of years for a family, you know? It's like... Right, yeah. And so, you know, there may be people listening like, yeah, we played with those and nothing happened. Oh, okay. I guess it's like got lucky, but don't. don't I call do it. I call it. I call it like drink driving. I mean, you can drink drive, you can have a few drinks, you might not get spotted. You might not get spotted by the cops. You might do it 10, 100 times. But eventually you'll get caught by the cops. Yeah. So or you'll... Bringing it back to, to Warhammer, let's look at the, the Emperor for a minute, right? So the Emperor is this this psyker, I guess. You know, he's a... The ultimate psyker. Ultimate psyker, right? And he sees mm. the problems in the world and he knows that if it's going to be fixed... You know, he's, he's the guy for it. How does that, and, and he's a wonderful example of, you know, you can't justify the means for the end. Right? Once, once you make that compromise with, with chaos, with virtue, you know, vice in this case, um, it's going to come back to haunt you. And in this world, there's no, there's no method of repentance. You know, he's the closest well, thing to a positive figure you have in the spiritual realm and the thing doesn't care what humanity does in the meantime um he would just if you know but a figure like that in the real world in this world would be an antichrist the figure like the emperor appears he would be an antichrist because he's not of god it doesn't matter how you know and and he appears as an angel of light, and he yeah, prays to him, and he gives them power, and protects them against things they're scared of. Yeah, yeah, great. Example. And and um, he's a rational man of science, but yeah, he's all a rational. He's a scientist. He's everything like that. And um, you know, he he we, you know, he can be he can be anyone to any anything. He's like this science guy, so. In today's culture, he would not appear as this ultimate psyche. He'd just be a guy who knows who is a scientifically literate and can make wonderful inventions. Right. Yeah, and persuasive arguments. Right. Yes. Yeah. So he he didn't just play. He didn't just create the custodians or and the you know the the nephilim. Um, can you talk about the the psychers? Right, so the psychers, this this phenomenon showed up in the human race, right, and yep. was part of the, the, the dark night, right, yep. and 
even before. So like you have it all through the centuries. All through it, it right. Like so, one... you, so you have these, you know, descriptions of, you know, these warrior ciphers and stuff and, the, you know, they would make packs yeah. with demons and stuff. And all all sorts wars. of things like that. So in that fiction, you'd have all the great religious men were all psychers of some kind or, and because Earth was not really, Chaos didn't really care, but they'd use the warp to do all these things or you'd hear about some wonder worker, it'd be a, there'd be a psycher, but they were like... The, you know, the one in a billion. But right. as um, mankind developed in thousands of the dark age of technology when mankind was, before they got to that stage, was technologically super advanced, that's when they discovered them. And the more psychers there were, see, the thing is, being a psyker is you tap into the warp, okay? It's like if you could um, had a direct link to the spirit world, and you could every time you did something, you opened up a doorway like a human Ouija board. What do you think the effects would be in the real world of, of today? Yeah, yeah. You can a lot of it cause chaos. A lot of chaos. And he tried to harness it, so he knew how dangerous it was. But for example, I mean, inner, inner, I don't know what to call it, interstellar travel. You know. Yeah, interstellar travel that'd been mastered when mankind had mastered science. And we're using robots, basically. You've got to... I should explain about the dark age of technology that led... that the Emperor harnessed when he was in disguise or hidden around. It was where humanity was so powerful they could create supernovas, um, used robots, like super powerful robots, had starships that could travel, travel through time, travel to other galaxies, shoot guns... They, they could shoot black holes at targets that could, and if they missed, they could just send another shot two seconds back in time to catch your opponent. They could construct anything they wanted. But that had fallen due to a, to a civil war when they, um, when the machines rebelled, that's when they lost most of the technology and most of the humanity, that was humanity's fall. And then the psychers came along and then they had the warp storms and that's the age of strife basically. So why did he decide to uh, turn to psychers in order to replace technology? Well, most of the technology was gone, and you had the priests of Mars who worshipped technology. Um, that's a whole other thing. But the 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 Mechanicum were a sect of of a religious sect that worshipped technology in the form of a god, in the form of the machine god. So that hoard technology and that worship the technology and it was like talking to your car it was like worshipping your car basically or you'd get your car like servicing your car was to get it blessed so they would have a whole religion built around technology and machines and their their acts of worship were were servicing machinery or technology or whatever whatever your technology was they kept the remnants of the technology going now on now, with the psychers, the psychers were important for a number of ways in that you could use them as astropaths to send telepathic messages across the galaxy. Um, they could um, – you could use them to uh, – what else could you use? You could use them for their different abilities. You could use them in battle, for example. But the emperor, his way was to soul bind them. He would give them a bit of his power and he could control them because the last thing you wanted was an uncontrollable psycho because you'd have a demonic incursion. So that's yeah. why. And so, yeah, the, those the silent can... sisterhood go out and yeah, anytime and catch... there was a, uh, a rumor, they would go investigate. Yeah. And, and so they were soul bonded to him so that they were, were controllable. The, the, um, that's the psycho. The silent sisterhood were. were 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 psychic nulls. They were not psychic at all. They were a blank. So they had no presence in the warps. So any time they'd go near a psycho, they couldn't be detected. And their psychic power psychic powers wouldn't affect them. So is that now is that a psychic I mean, is that chaos related? I mean how do you have a no, null? How are you a null? I mean are you and I null? You have no presence in the warp. Mundane? Okay. You have no presence every because in the warp every Every, everything has a presence in the warp. Okay? Now, a null doesn't. So it's not affected by the warp. 
But most people, like you said, most people do, even if they're not able to manipulate it, yeah. they still have a relationship so, with the war. So these, so this particular, so these particular beings are are um are just an anomaly. They just um they just have no e, e, no particular um um presence or whatever. It's like I don't know. Um, you know, you know, creation. It's like something coming from outside creation into creation. Right. Yeah. So these are these are not like muggles. You know, they, there's something else going on. This is like the yeah. anti psyker. Right. But and the way to, to the better way to describe it. You know how you have angels, you got spirits, you have spirit yep. and principalities and things. When I mean something coming outside of creation, I mean something out of that, outside of that that's not recognized by any of the spiritual hierarchies on in this universe. Now, something like that is such an anomaly. I think creation itself would probably have issues. I think it would, it would probably really cause problems. Right. And that's, yeah. Yeah. So great idea. Right. So having this, this, you know, military force or spy force or whatever you want to call it of these people is it's bound to have its own effect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, and then, that's so cool. Yeah, because let's let's just go over a little bit of it. So, um, in general, the idea is that there's this um, there's this part of creation that people are connected to, and it it takes the negative energy. Again, there's no positive, right? It's just energy. And, it's just and, energy. And so it's just energy. So one of the original demons, um, you know, one of the mythologies is that it was created when Cain killed Abel. Oh, right. I thought, yeah, okay. When Cain, yeah, so like when Cain, that was the first murder. When Cain killed Abel, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, you've got this, and I forget which book it is, but it's when they're... It's Master of Mankind. Master of Mankind. Okay, yeah. And, you know, you're like, oh, huh, that's neat, right? And then over time it just grows because it's feeding off this psychic energy and that's what the emperor taps into. And so one of, you, one of the great ironies that's going on during the Horus heresy is the Lecto Divino, um, right? The, this idea that the emperor is God. And the word bearers, they got in trouble for it, right? But there was this whole underground cult for it because it worked. Yeah, and that's basically what you, what you and James were talking about. Just because something works doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, even if and, it uses things like light, right, and, and this idea of connection and love and devotion, right, <laughs> you, you can have false religion. Hmm. Yeah. But and the emperor, wanna... so I, I want people to get the scope of this. So it's not too surprising. It's disappointing, but it's not too surprising when, remember when the... Um, Magnus, when he was trying to do something very powerful, he had this whole thousands of sacrifices just set up, and they would just do them one after the other, right? But the emperor, right? That's when, in the story, as they as they reveal things about the emperor, that's one of the things where you're like, huh, this yeah, and then this isn't, and then the other, yeah, and that's it. And the other thing is, when the emperor basically. Um, they they get these cycles in the black ships, but the thing is, what happens to the ones too weak? And this happens later on. Is the emperor uses he 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 just consumes their souls. He just eats their souls. So they're all going to see this nice emperor, and he's going, and they're sacrificed to him basically. Yeah. And that's the like, you know. Yeah, so it's not such world, a good. It's not like you're sacrificed. Oh, and then your soul goes, you know, to its reward. No, no, he's eating the soul. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And the, and the soul becomes, in general, it becomes um, fodder for whatever chaos or someone who controls chaos can do with it, right? It's a very yeah, bleak and, world. Yeah, and the emperor just takes, because um, there's, there's these Draco ones where the emperor just consumes these souls that become part of it, to become part of his psychic power. So he's like an engine. He's just got to keep consuming this engine because after he gets, gets wounded or nearly dead, He's, he's powering this 
this the golden throne to stop the chaos portal opening up and the demons coming out so he needs to get more power so it's shovel the psychers in shovel the more souls you know and you get to see that even when he's doing that he he, he might have been consu- you, you get the expression that he's been consuming the odds some of the psychers from the black ships here and there mm. how many you don't know to live all the centuries he has yeah yeah, and like you said, he figured out how to do that kind of a bargain when he was making his Nephilim. Right. And um, the the um, and the other thing is he, he's made his Nephilim, and he the other thing it got me thinking. I was reading one of the Monster Hunter International books. I think it was about Agent Franks. Oh, great! Stuff. And what ha- and now? You, the agent Franks has a thing. He said, you cannot make any more of me for one specific reason, because he's a fallen angel and he escaped from hell, right? And he went and uh, um, inhabited the Frankenstein body, right? But the bad guy, Strickland, make, decides to make some super soldiers. So what happens is the demons in hell um, decide to inhabit those bodies because, hey, cool, a body. Let's go, you know. And that's one of the issues with transhumanism. You can't just create these things in this world in a vacuum because there are beings, spiritual beings out there who would just absolutely love just inhabiting a working body without a soul, you know. Yeah, that's that's what they want. They're looking for a, a home. And, you know, part of the, the mythology, and it's not, it's not doctrine, but it's, it's part of the backstory is that when the Nephilim were killed in the flood, they released their souls. The souls had nowhere to go because there was no place created for them because they were unnatural. And so they just looked for for a body to inhabit. Yeah. And that became... And um, and the funny thing, is, just, just going off that, is um, the whole Agent Frank's um, thing was, um, um, you know, he... He's finding redemption in that particular arc, where he's gone from fallen angel because he didn't support uh, God's God, the the Mormon plan at the time, you know. Um, but yeah, the point is, every time you create a vacuum, and I think the same thing goes for any kind of cloning, anything like that, or any kind of data information or artificial intelligence. You've got spiritual beings that love to get into these systems and if they give them give them half a chance they will yeah and that's that's not part of the conversation right it's it's not like you say hey let's let's be careful with this artificial intelligence because there may be outside intelligences that will manipulate it you know and but <laughs> it's just you know it's but instead we could say hey we don't we don't know where this might go but it's a very, it's a very, it's a very, it's a, very, it's, 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 it's a, it's a high percentage. If you need a risk assessment, if you would talk, it's like, but on, cause you, you know, you read about these things on Twitter, or not on Twitter. I mean, you know, how they, you know, I'm surprised. I mean, someone might say to me, well, if they can inhabit information, why aren't they on Twitter? But the thing is, Twitter is such a cesspit and such a, some of the nasty comments on there, you wouldn't even know. You wouldn't know. You know? Yeah, so that's a great question. How would you know? So let's imagine that I came up with this. this let's just use a, a simpler technology, cloning, right? So yeah. I, I have my body cloned, and then um, they say that they have a way to transfer my intelligence because they wouldn't use word consciousness, right? Yeah. How would you know? How would you know whether you were in soul or just uh, someone who could imitate you, right? You well, just created this wonderful tool for them. You well, this, yeah, well, the same thing happened in the 19th century. You know, with the, we had the spiritualism. Yep. Um, this, this, there was, um, Harry Houdini gave his wife a, a particular piece of information. Um, and she wasn't to tell anybody about it. And all the apparitions and all the seances of her husband that appeared, she kept asking him, well, they couldn't give the answer. But until she told someone, they didn't know. 
Right. So you need to have that kind of <laughs> that kind of thing to make sure. But even then, you know, the information is not foolproof because people can overhear. They can. Yeah. You know, so as long as you tell one person, like you told his wife, that's subject yeah. to eavesdropping, right? So it's yeah, it's, it's very difficult. It's a it's a tough and, tough challenge. And if it's an uncon, I believe it's if you, if it's an unconfessed sin, then you know. Um, but um, yeah, you, you know, you wouldn't know. How would you do that? Because um, you could, I mean, in the technocratic society that we live in, if you come along and say, "Hey, I want to go perform an exorcism on my on my on my on my child's new clone." I'd probably be looked up and locked up if I could get a priest to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, the only other alternative is to get some holy water, but people don't think like that because we're living in an age where anything spiritual is put to the side. It's, oh, I'm spiritual but not religious. And you have a spiritual deadling. So, you know, People aren't going to go look for a spiritual solution for a spiritual problem. They're going to look for a medical solution to a spiritual problem or a physical solution to a spiritual problem, which, you know, is not good at all. Yeah, yeah. And let's, I've only got a, a few more minutes, but just to, to yeah. kind of tie this up in a, in a bow. So in the, yeah. in the world of, of Warhammer, there is only negative. There's only negative yes. demonic energy, chaos energy. There's no manifestation of, of positive energy to counter that. So it's, you know, it's it's a very oh. it's a Cthulhu world, right? It's everything it's is, is out to get you, right? Every scrim dark. It's it's basically you get killed. It's all the grim dark, and in that world, yeah, as I say, you to be in that world, you you to be a man amongst the millions, and you will not be missed. Basically, is the is the tie is is what it is. Um, now we live in a world, and that's that's quite a bit different. And you know, the real world that we live in is one where the God, right, has already won this victory over yeah. chaos, over evil, over all of these things, and that we can participate in it through our life. In Christ, as part of the, the new humanity yeah. of Christ, right? If you deny, if you say, you know, there's there's no spiritual world, which is where you know that, that's where a lot of people are, right? There's no real spiritual world, or you say, oh, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. There's only positive, you know. It's all about frequencies. I'm learning to operate at a higher frequency, right? Yeah. Then, no, no, that's that's living in a world trying to live in a world as it doesn't exist. And so there are bound to be inefficiencies, shall we say. So. Um, but one of the things I want to bring up is I'm actually planning a note, okay, and I'm going to have it about a guy who's operating on that. Um, a paranormal investigator, college professor, who goes into that world, in this world where he is a man of God, he's got a guardian, a bit of urban fantasy, a guardian guardian, a guardian angel who protects him, and he's around these spiritual people who are Wiccans and have all this power. But he has, but the rever, the revelation of the story is is what they're doing. It might look cool and it might do things. Is all a lie because he has, you know? Do you, do you follow me? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. And and he's he, he he's from Australia, of course. And he yeah he meets the people from these different things. Like, he'll meet the Wiccans and that. They'll help him with cases and stuff. And, he, yeah, he might get down, but he realises at the end of the journey, he's going to realise all they're doing is just being fooled by the same enemy. He's just... This spiritual world is not what they think it is. It's not... Um, it's not... It's not, like, some, anything for the taking. It's, it's got rules. It's got, you know... And, you know, that's what it will be. And um, that's what I wanted to do, that the whole to show that. Um, because for me, when I want to talk about the spiritual world, you know, what would I, if I was going to write a novel, I've read a lot of urban fantasy, 
I want to show it in the Christian way, but I want to do it, you know, in that way. Have it there, but show what's going on. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, and, and maybe have somebody in the story who's, you know, just seems to be simple and naive. I do. But is completely um, unmanipulable. Oh, I do. I've already got the character sorted out. It's going to be my urban monastic. Yeah, good, good, good. He's... He, He's a wonder worker. The idea is a wonder worker, like, you know, St. Anthony, all the saints of old. He lives homeless, right? And you know how they live in the desert? Well, these guys live in the abandoned buildings, in the abandoned rubble, and they're living around there. And um, there's going to be an Orthodox church, a really good parish in there, which our hero doesn't get associated with till later. And the old, and the old homeless monk guy, he's a priest, and he ministers to these homeless monks that live out there and because he's so humble he looks like a p- homeless person and he's he just wanders around and gives our hero advice in the first novel like if he's walking by he'll just come up to him and just say i wouldn't do that if i were you or you might want to look over there you know yeah <laughs> cool you just imagine a superpower wonder worker who looks he just looks he looks like a homeless guy yeah yeah because, because he's there would be a simplicity yeah, and that's the, that's the thing, and you've got, and because um, he's totally, like you were saying, this guy is, this character is how I've thought him out, he's completely unmanipulable, unmanipulable, he can't be manipulated in any way, shape or form, he's like the greatest of wonder workers, but he's that humble, he can just walk through and not be bothered by anything, you know, like you know, like the Desert Fathers battling legions of demons. This is just, he's just such a simple, humble man who goes about his prayer and lives in these abandoned building and parks and things. And he has his flock amongst the homeless. Yeah, that's great. And you can contrast that with a character like Constantine, right? Who's, you know, yeah. love the character, right? But that's that's yeah. not what he is. He's, he's manipulated. He's using talismans and he has some innate power, right? Yeah. But it's, but it's not based on that simplicity. It's not through a connection with, you know, grace. Yeah. And such a character like the, the homeless monk I'm t- t- talking about, urban monastic, he is a, is going to be a, a minor character, not a major character in the story, because it's going to be about my Aussie guy, who is suffered a tragedy and trying to work his way through this spiritual world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll probably... Uh, I'll probably need a lot. I'll talk to a few people. I wanted to mention, Father, that um, I'll probably to do the. I've got to get myself to. I'm still planning it out in my head, mind you. Um, but that's the idea. But I'll need to talk to people like um, like you and a few, if any other one can help in getting, you know, the research right because I want to get the spirituality right, but um, just getting it through. But well, just yeah, and I'm not a writer. But I do encourage you to do this. But the thing is to write yeah. something every day, even if it's just yeah. a sentence. To write just a and I'm, and as my teachers at school used to say about me, I was as lazy as sin. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's a great idea. I'd love to see it. And you know, as popular as uh, the Harry Dresden books are and the Monster Hunter books are, you know, it taps into this because you know we're we're interested, and in I think we have a sense that there's more out there, and it would be good to have. You know, I like the Dresden series, and Harry Dresden is a is a virtuous character, and then you know he's got his friend friend Michael. You know, the relationship there is excellent. Um, but you could do it even better. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and I just got to get myself to write it in the spelling and grammar, because and the idea is there, and the truth about um, I might both be the I'm probably not the greatest writer in the world. My spelling and grammar a bit difficulty, but the idea is don't write it to a genre. Don't, I don't believe in writing a specifically an Orthodox Christian book because I think the idea of genre is stupid. And, and Father right Andrew well. Steeman, right, right. yeah, which is going to be the challenge, but the ideas are good. But um, the point is Father Andrew actually said something very, very, very in, about music and it stuck with me. And it was secular music was always better than, you know, the – you know, fake the pen of Christian rock, Christian heavy yes. metal, simply because it was what it was and it wasn't pretending to be something it's not. And 
Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's... But, well, um, very good. And, yeah, again, I encourage you, and I'll, I'd love to, to help out. And don't worry about the, the grammar and stuff like that. Of course you're going to have problems with that, but that's why you have friends. So Yeah, and I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm and, yeah, thank you. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah we, but, um, you know, the thing is... Um, back to Warhammer, what, what I say to people is, remember, Warhammer is basically the cruelest, bloody and bloodiest regime imaginable. It's the, it, it's, 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 you can imagine, what, what I do, when I try and describe the, um, the kind of world you, you could probably face, although quite diverse, is, you know how you see those people, um, on some worlds in 40k, you know how you got those people that check your receipt at Walmart. I've been watching audit videos, right? Hey man, I want to check your receipt, and they stand in front of people's carts and they won't let them leave until they search show them the receipt. And then, in the 40k units, the universal security guard goes bang and shoots you. Didn't show your receipt. That's it. That's it. That's the. <laughs> yeah, and and in a world like that, you can have temporary virtue, right? And that's one of the yeah. things about the stories. But look, I'm going to have to go. Um, you got it. it's, it's been wonderful talking with you, and we'll, we'll do this no. again. And we'll, let's talk about some of the other things that we've read, too, because you're a voracious yeah. reader. You read so oh, much, and, and, and I love talking to you about all the different plots. Same. And yeah. All right. And uh, um, Son of the Black Sword, if you can get in there, and Larry's done a new sci- sci-fi one. Right. Yep. And they're on the list. Gun runner. <laughs> all right, everybody. Um, until right. next time. No worries. And... Um, See you, everybody. Stay cool.